I get to say a few words of welcome to the Honorable Mayor of the City of Vaughan, Mauricio Bevilacqua. So um, we're delighted that you're here. Uh, he, we're in for a treat. He's chairing our panel, our very first panel. And I think I can think of no one better than to do this uh, because I can attest firsthand having been a longtime resident of the city of Vaughan for over 35 years. So I've seen his work in action and he's just been incredible. He works, he has this uplifting vision. He uh, does things with rigor, passion, and really tireless dedication. And he truly has built up the city of Vaughan. I don't even recognize it from, you know, when I first moved there. So that's all uh, thanks to you, Mayor Bevilacqua. And uh, I also think that we're among his last official business as mayor. Because for those of you who don't know, he's decided not to seek re-election as he completes his third very successful term as mayor and a much beloved mayor. So I'd like to just, if we could take a, a moment to recognize that and honor you and give you a big round of applause for all your service. And you know, can I say a few words about you? Well, you got the mic. Okay, <laughs> I love it. So prior to becoming mayor, Mayor Bevilacqua was a member of parliament for 22 years, serving in several roles, including Minister of State for Finance, Minister of uh, State for Science, Research and Development, and Chair of the House of Commons Standing Committee on Finance. And I can tell you, it goes on a little bit longer here. He's the chair of the Finance and Administration Committee for the Regional Municipality of York, vice chair of the Regional Municipality of York Police Services Board, and vice chair of York Region Rapid Transit Corporation. Mayor Bevilacqua also serves as a director on the Electra Board, and uh, that's where um, I also get to interact with him, and a member of Electra's Human Resources and Compensation Committee. He's a member of the Global City Leaders Advisory Board for the World Council on City Data and the Advisory Council for the Postgraduate Certificate in Business Administration at York University School of Continuing Studies. Now he's the chair of the City of Vaughan Smart City Task Force, where I also got a chance to work with him and chair of the Ready, Resilient and Resourceful Committee. Mayor Bevilacqua is also chair of the Vaughan Healthcare Precinct Advisory Task Force and chair of the Vaughan Metropolitan Center Subcommittee. He is chair of McKenzie Health Foundation and was instrumental in the 250 million ultimate campaign in building that up. Chair of the Hospice Vaughan Capital Campaign and co-chair of the Lou Fruitman Rena Residence Capital Campaign. He's also very accomplished academically uh, Mayor Bevilacqua holds a Bachelor of Arts degree from York, yay, you picked well, a Master of Arts degree from Fordham, and a Master of Laws degree from the University of Toronto. Now, I know you've had a lot of uh, chair roles, Mayor Bevilacqua, but I bet being chair of panel one uh, on AI for the future of urban development will be the cherry on top. Yes. So a very warm and, welcome uh, to you. And my, uh, my resume will be updated accordingly. Um, <laughs> I want thank to you. thank you so much, uh, Pina. And um, I just want you to know that there's a delay in the, in the video, right, in the stream. So I, actually, you gave me two applauses, which I really like. I, saw, I heard it, and then I hear it here as well. Um, so as soon as I walked in, somebody said to me, you have four days left, right? And I said, you better finish that sentence. You mean four days as mayor. Um, but I, I just want to say how pleased I am. This is my alma mater. Actually, my, my son taught at the, at the, uh, at the uh, law school here, Hospital Law School, and uh, had a great experience uh, teaching, I think, for four or five years. Um, and coaching the arbitration and mediation uh, team, and th there's sort of like an Olympics competition uh, where uh, students from all over the world participate. And I'm really proud of him because uh, as a coach, he delivered a couple of gold medals. And uh, the first time actually that both in our arbitration and mediation, uh, York University won both. So please applaud my son, um, <laughs> Jean-Paul. I want to um, say to you that um, as a, a person who's been in public life for 34 years now, both at the uh, 
uh, federal and, and, and municipal uh, level. I just want you to know that everywhere I go, obviously, I put uh, my own filter in conversations because we all come in with sort of a context. In my context, because I am in public service and because I'm an elected official, uh, I always view things uh, through the prism of uh, what we as a society, as individuals do, how does it improve the human condition? Because quite frankly, I think that is the purpose of life. Uh, how do we use our existence on earth uh, to in fact um, bring about positive change to people's lives? And so every time I attend a conference, I, I always think about that uh, because I think all of us in this room are here because we do believe that life needs to be a meaningful, purposeful, and fulfilling experience. And uh, AI is part of that conversation. It's, um, it's our ability to use artificial intelligence uh, to do that. And so when we talk about the issue related to transportation, for example, ultimately, how does that improve people's lives? Um, how does uh, artificial intelligence take us to the next level uh, in, in making sure that our, our life's experiences um, are, are better and, and more meaningful? I say this to provide context because it's important to, to sit down and, 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 and soak it all in. And so we have great speakers here who are going to uh, give us uh, the privilege uh, to, to listen to, to ideas that speak, I think, to essentially that reality, uh, because ultimately that is what it's about. And we have Professor Zachary Spicer, Dr. Vera Roberts, Professor Guy Seidman, and uh, Keith Hemingway. Uh, they will be uh, our speakers. Um, I will talk very briefly here uh, about the, my role as mayor and, and, and uh, Pina. Um, I want to say a few words about you as well. And I'm chair of the board, obviously, stole most of what I was going to say, but that's okay. Um, her, uh, uh, as I often say when I speak about Pina, her record speaks for herself. I, I think that um, she's a dynamic person. I, I, she sits on the Smart City Task Force with me at the, um, at the city. Uh, also, stellar performance at Electra uh, as a member of the board. And by the way, she represents the city of Vaughan. Uh, so don't be surprised that she's excellent. That's what I'm trying to tell you. Um, it's, uh, I'm really proud of citizens uh, like Pina because uh, not only uh, are they professors of this great uh, um, law school, but they also give back to the community. And remember where I'm coming from. As an elected official, I look for those things. I look for people who uh, truly care about bringing positive change uh, to, to our community. And she's done that in so many, in so many ways. And the chair, you, you've, you've covered many uh, of, the, of the points. And, and always, sometimes, you know, when we talk about an individual, we always attach a title to, to the individual. It's sort of, you know, something that we do as a society. You know, there are professors, there are lawyers, there are consultants, there are, there are dead batteries. And, um, <laughs> the, um, but I, I also think that it's very important uh, to understand not only what the person does, but who the person is. And Pina is a very caring, compassionate, uh, nurturing individual who truly cares about what she does. And uh, as mayor of the city of Vaughan, I, I want to say how, how happy I am uh, to see her involvement uh, your, 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 and, and the impact they're having, uh, not only Electra, but the city of Vaughan, but also obviously, uh, judging from the reception you got, you're doing excellent work here uh, by, um, by, by providing uh, such wise advice and, and organizing the meeting of the minds, which I think is very important. Now, her real claim to fame, however, is that uh, she handed Jean Paul his law degree at the uh, ceremony. Jean Paul was my son, for those of you who are not keeping up. Uh, <laughs> um, and so I want to thank you for that. That was a very special moment in our family's life. So thank you. Um, so, in, in reference to the city of Vaughan, uh, which is. Uh, something that we want to talk about, and, and, and Pina is uh, involved, we, we identified the smart city um, opportunities to, to move our, our city forward uh, through, through innovation, information, and communication technology. 
And this is all part and parcel of uh, accountability and transparency in, uh, in, in our government. And how do we, you know, use data uh, to, uh, to improve uh, services? And you probably, you know, in the narrative of what I'm saying, you probably noticed that I go back always to the issue of how do you improve life for, for people. And one of the uh, key areas of focus was uh, mobility management and uh, how we could use smart city initiatives uh, to improve road safety, uh, reduce traffic and, and congestion, and encourage residents to participate in active transportation. And we've taken some major steps. You probably know that the city of Vaughan is the only uh, city um, outside of the city of Toronto that actually has a subway. Um, Mississauga doesn't have one. Brampton doesn't have one. Markham will eventually get one. Uh, this is my last boastful act as mayor. Um, but, um, but this is very important for us. And um, our new uh, Move Smart Mobility Management Strategy has really guided our city's efforts uh, to improve and build more reliable, integrated uh, transportation uh, system. And um, we are now well known in, in, the, in the 905 area as, as a city that um, has really designed excellence and, and uh, flexible planning, uh, as well as convenient uh, travel options. And you know, it's very interesting when we, when we think of transportation and transportation investments, <laughs> You know, there are periods, as you know, when the transportation system is being built where the ridership is low and it could get quite discouraging and uh, because nobody likes to see empty buses, right? But you've got to stay firm. You've got to stay dedicated. You, you can't let go of that important uh, element of city building, which is uh, developing a transit system and network. Uh, and, and, and you will see, and I get the phone calls, right? You know, we wish, I wish, you know, we had more, um, we had more people on those buses, but what we noticed is there's an upward trend now where millions of people, there are millions of riders uh, uh, throughout uh, the year, and what has really helped us is obviously the subway. Uh, the subway that uh, has this interconnectedness with, um, with, uh, with the city of Toronto. Um, I want to talk a little bit about our, um, Panelists, they, they all bring extensive uh, experience to today's discussion, which, are, which will range from the role of smart cities in the modern world to artificial intelligence and data uh, cont cont uh, contribution to urban development. And so I guess we're going we're gonna to get started. And um, we're going to get started, and, and the focus uh, of the first speaker will be data governance and industry interactions with, with government structures. And it will be uh, Professor uh, Zachary uh, Spicer to, to kick it off. Yep, um, more, more than happy to. Um, thanks so much. So um, I wanted to uh, start off today to talk a little bit about uh, municipal government and capacity as it relates to uh, smart city development. Um, so as you mentioned, I'm a uh, professor of public policy. Most of the work that I do focuses on local governments, and uh, all of that um, has to happen through the lens of constraints. So constraint over resources, uh, constraint by scale, uh, constraint by, by uh, legislation from, from the province. And my interest in, in, uh, in smart cities kind of stems uh, from this as well. So smart cities represent uh, a unique type of capacity, scale, and resource challenge for municipal governments. Um, and I'll talk about that in a second, but first I want to talk about uh, some of the benefits that, uh, that AI and different ICTs may actually offer for, for municipal governments. So we've heard uh, about some related to, uh, to transportation of on, obviously, um, but I want to sort of talk about some other things here. Uh, necessarily that the, the, the servicing and policy responsibility for municipal governments hasn't really changed over the past 100 years. We've, we typically think of local governments as service delivery agents. Right? I would kind of challenge that, that conceptualization. I think you probably would as well. Um, but we, we think of them as doing things for us, right? Plowing snow, paving roads, stuff like this, right? Um, all of these things cost money. Municipal budgets are tight. I don't have to tell you that, obviously. Um, uh, but uh, AI and, and ICTs and smart city technology gives us an opportunity to do more with less, right? So we can maximize budgets, create efficiencies, and save money. 
With that said, smart city technology also brings a host of brand new challenges, right? So um, municipalities um, can and do, uh, do, do procure vast amounts of technology, but they can't necessarily build it on their own. So um, this essentially means that most of these arrangements are public-private partnerships. Not necessarily a bad thing. Municipalities provide a lot of services that they don't necessarily produce. So this isn't uh, a sort of strange phenomenon. Um, but the question is uh, if there's always a clear understanding of what is being purchased and how it is being used. Um, so let me just use an example of roads. Um, every municipality has uh, a roads person. So let's just, for the sake of simplicity, call that guy Steve, right? Every municipality has a Steve, a director of roads. They know how to procure asphalt. They know how, how to procure construction services, stuff like this. They've been doing it for a very long time, uh, whether it's uh, a very large city or a very small town. They know exactly what to procure. They know uh, estimates based on weather, traffic usage, stuff like this. Um, the question is, do people like Steve understand data governance agreements related to road sensors? Right? Do they understand the implications for international trade agreements as it comes to data control? Right? Uh, not necessarily. Right? In some places like Vaughan, Toronto, certainly there is understanding and skill related to AI technology and everything else. You, you move a bit farther outwards, uh, that's not necessarily there. But this is who we're putting the work of data governance on, right? People like Steve. Uh, we're, we're, we're asking a lot from them, and, and the question that I always have is, is whether this is necessarily fair, right? Do, do we, are we giving them the resources that they need to properly evaluate data governance and control agreements? Um, do they have the skill to, un to understand and evaluate the sort, of, the sort of technology that we are asking them to, uh, to uh, implement within our road systems or anywhere else. Um, the other thing uh, that I want to talk about here very, very briefly uh, is acquiring skill. So municipalities are very good at, at, at acquiring things. Um, I think when it comes to AI and smart, city, uh, and smart city technology, they need to be a lot more concerned about acquiring skill. Right? How do we find people who understand AI governance systems, people who, who, understand, dat who, who, who understand data governance, who understand smart city smart city technology, and how do we uh, turn these people into public servants? And I think that, um, that that's something that's an interesting question. I again apologize, I'm coming here with uh, a lot more questions than I have answers, but I guess that's a, that's a point of events like this. Um, so I just sort of uh, wrap up by, by identifying what I'm kind of concerned about in terms of a skills gap, a capacity gap, and a participation and engagement gap when it comes to procuring smart city technology within municipalities in Canada. And I'll, I'll wrap it up there because I'm cognizant of time. We have some of your wonderful panelists who have great things to say. So thank you very much. Thank you so much for that. You have us a lot to think about already. Uh, Dr. Bear Roberts, you're next. Uh, well, I, uh, I feel a little bit at a disadvantage. I was expecting questions and didn't come prepared with notes. But I will tell you why I'm here today. And uh, it's great to see all of you, and that's certainly a motivator. But I'm here in part to represent the voice of people with disabilities in AI data systems. Um, and this is an important voice because many of our data systems are based on uh, majority. They're based on the um, most common feature. And one of the things about disability is that the only common feature you have, if you have a disability, is that you're different from the normal. And so this is not a distinct group. We can't just fix AI data and systems by adding data about people who fit in a disability group, because that group doesn't exist. That group is very heterogeneous. It's, and looking at finding ways to improve how we're teaching our systems uh, means that we really need to think about this problem. And I really like that we've already talked about the issue of data governance. I think it's really tremendous that you brought that up because data governance applies to all of us. And all of us have to be concerned about our data privacy. So there's a lot of promise with AI, and I'm not an AI naysayer. But I am here to say we need to be thinking about 
some of the ways that AI may not provide the flexibility that we expect. Many of us think that when we bring in an AI system that we've introduced pure logic, that it will be flawless, that it won't be biased because it removes the human element. But the problem with most AI systems is that they've actually been trained on human data. And humans are flawed, our data is flawed, and it is biased. And we see that AI systems often amplify some of the challenges and biases that we experience in society. And so when we think about how we're going to use data, we need to be thinking about a number of things. What data do we have? What biases might it be introducing? Who is it impacting? Especially people who are already feeling marginalized because of disability, but others too who are at the margins of whatever context they're in. And then we need to be thinking about who controls our data and who do we give permission to to use our data. So a little bit of a naysayer, but not too bad, I hope. I think there is some promise and I want us to look at it together. Thanks. Thank you so much for that. I think you raised some important issues in relationship to you know, the notion of fairness and equity and inclusion. Uh, because whatever we do in, in, in our society uh, cannot be excluding individuals. And you Absolutely. said something about artificial intelligence I thought was uh, interesting, and you said it's not perfect, right? Right. Neither is intelligence, by the way. <laughs> It doesn't have to be artificial for its perfection. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And of course, I'm not saying that humans are necessarily better. What I'm saying is AI is based on human intelligence and we are flawed. And our AI also has flaws that we just need to be aware of. We need to address those things. And I was a bit remiss because I should have plugged my center a little bit. Uh, at the Inclusive Design Research Center where I work, uh, we've been conducting a few projects to try to address this. Uh, and uh, one of them would be We Count, which I encourage all of you to go to our website and look at some of the things we're doing to address bias in the data system. Um, but I've also had the pleasure in that project to look at Cybox Labs, MI, uh, the uh, Master Innovation Development Plan, and do some assessments of it. And I think in those assessments that are on the We Count site, you can also see some interesting uh, challenges that could be posed through AI systems. Thanks for that. Thanks for letting me plug the center. Yeah, no, that was good. And thanks for saying that we're all flawed. Uh, the, um... <laughs> well, depends who you ask. Yes. Um, we're going to Keith Hemingway. Yeah, Welcome. Um, so I think in, in my view, AI is not new. And what the change now is, it's becoming more mainstream. It was a nerdy thing before. Now everybody's kind of hearing about it and knowing about it. But what I find with AI, the big change is that the availability of data. And coming from the utility uh, background, we're very cognizant of cyber attacks, cybersecurity. And so what's the change I see over the last little while is the technology improvement in able to get that data out of protected systems that were uh, hidden away from public. It was air-gapped, you couldn't get it. And that data is critically important for utilities now to plan where we're going in the future because we're seeing a very big trend towards of e-mobility, electrification of, uh, of transit. Uh, we're seeing a big trend towards electrification of heating coming. And the old ways of working of just putting up more poles and wires in the electricity sector aren't necessarily the way we need to go forward. And we need to start utilizing new tools like AI with our, with our data to forward ourselves to build new platforms and new uh, new schemes so that we can we can move forward and build without we, we want to be very cautious of building utility equipment out without overspending without using a traditional we don't want to put that cost back on on the uh, on the on the ratepayer but what I think it really boils down to is data privacy and not just data privacy in your personal identification uh, data that we all we all do very well in trying to protect and and I think the my other colleagues here on the panel have raised some very good data privacy issues, and I see that being addressed as cybersecurity becomes very front of front of mind. But data privacy in that, if I give you a real world example, that as we get more operational data out of our, our core systems, we want to be able to pinpoint where a fault is occurring. Our customers and our ratepayers are getting less and less tolerant to outages. So if we can pinpoint exactly where a fault is occurring, can we send a drone down there and 
examine the pole line to see our, 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 our overhead equipment for damage, for, for, uh, for issues, and rectify that in a faster manner. But anything you're doing with cameras out there, you always have overshoot. We may only care about an insulator, but we can, we can see into a backyard. It starts to get creepy if all of a sudden, you know, we do a line scan with a, with a drone and all of a sudden you're getting uh, in your inbox, you know, we've noticed that you have, you know, old patio equipment. So here, here's, some, uh, here's some stuff. Here's a, you know, a coupon for some new patio equipment. And I think it really boils down to, in my mind, what is data? And everything comes back to data. It's all ones and zeros. Mm -hmm. Pictures, personal identification information, it's all ones and zeros. And how do we make that balance between the best for the public good, which is building a strong, resilient electrical system in our, in our, in our capacity, so that society, you know, there's obviously safety issues in society when the power's out, product, productivity issues in, in, our, in our economies, but also at the same time, utilize that data so that, and data governance is key, and I'm glad the, my other panelists have brought that up, because it is so key that data governance be forefront, because who is using that? I think on the utility sector, we are here for the public good. We are trying to make our cities and our communities better, but it gets weird if now, like when my example there of sending out <laughs> to you, you know, new patio equipment. Like, we want to keep that. We, we spend, as we discuss with different vendors, we're very cognizant of having our legal team and cybersecurity team sit down and review what the data we are going to send to a third party. It, even though it's just an image of an insulator or a pole, it still may have overshoot into your backyard, into your private life. And we want to be very cognizant of that as, as AI is growing. AI is neither good nor bad. It's how we program AI. And I think given the diversity of our, I choose to look at AI as being a very positive step forward for our, for our society and what we're able to do with AI in, in society, but it's still data and it still needs to be treated as a data privacy issue. And even though it's an image, it may be, it could be consumption data. We could see maybe you have an EV charging. Can we incentivize you through, you know, maybe deferring your load so that we don't have to build for a peak. We can spread our load out. In, speaking in electrical terms, we, it's much better for us not to have a more balanced load than, than, than large peaks. So if we can spread our load out by incentivizing you to maybe shift your EV charging, um, maybe we don't have to spend as much money to, to build our systems, but it still comes back to that AI, da that data, and that data privacy, I think, is key because when you have, who is getting that data, and who are you distributing that data to, and then if that gets in the wrong hands, what can they do? Because there's nothing, I don't, my personal opinion is I wouldn't want to get anything else. I think the, our, our ratepayers would be happy that we're trying to build a, a strong, resilient electrical system, but at the same time, you don't want us to start sending that out, that data out to other third parties who may not be as, uh, as strict with the data that, that we are. So I think it really turns to a lot of people here, and especially the, the, the lawyers in the room, what to do with privacy. Because at the end of the day, it's an image, it's a text, it all comes back to a one and zero, and that's data. So how do we protect that data, and what, what governance do we put around that data so that society as a whole is protected? Thank you. I just, uh, if I can, just for one second before I proceed to uh, Professor Guy Seidman. I, as, as this area of artificial intelligence and data gathering, uh, privacy and accessibility in your case, uh, becomes more and more important as a societal issue. Uh, have you found that your particular organization is investing a lot more time and resources in the field? Have you seen a dramatic change? Yes. And even over, like, we have a brilliant cybersecurity director in Electra, and I've learned so much from him. And just, I find it's the training, it's the constant knowledge upgrades. It's not so much, we have the experts, but it's those knowledge programs to shift that, that making the data be top of mind making cybersecurity be top of mind rather than as engineers, as technical folk, we tend to push forward with a solution and think, yeah, it's great. We, we have our best intentions, but we don't maybe look and say, well, could somebody else hack into this? We spend a lot of time securing those systems. And now as the world becomes more, more open and more connected, 
we have to make sure that that data is protected and we spend a significant amount of time protecting it. Cybersecurity for us is key, it's across every project it, and it's foundational. Thanks for that. We'll, I'm sure we'll get back to, to you uh, after. Uh, Professor, go ahead. Do I use the PowerPoint from here or over there? Cool. Professor Seidman, welcome. Thank you. Uh, tell me what you prefer, where you prefer me to be. It be easier for me to see the screen from here, though. Okay. So, yeah, I'm, they've told me not to prepare a PowerPoint presentation, so I have 21 slides. <laughs> short slides. And this is going to be a very tough crowd to follow, so I'll, I'll do my best. And I also realize I'm the last thing standing between you and your break, so I'll try to keep it brief. I probably won't, but I'll try. I have three points to make uh, over the next 21 slides, and I'll say them first, so in case I don't reach them, you know, I will have said them. Uh, first, uh, you know, the AVs are probably the most, uh, autonomous vehicles are probably the most important, uh, likely to be the most visible um, uh, impact that artificial intelligence is going to have uh, on our daily life. And to make a long story short, um, AVs are coming. Maybe not now, maybe in five years, 15 years, 25 years, but they're coming big time. And as someone who's not really interested in technology on a day-to-day -day basis, I am absolutely sure that they will come and will have a huge, huge impact. That is one of the reasons why the title Bracing for Impact is so apt because of all the little things that are going, I think this is one of the biggest ones um, coming, and I'll explain in a minute why. Um, the legal ramifications, I'm a lawyer, unfortunately, and to my parents' real, really sadness, they were really un unhappy about me going into the law. Um, I can only speak of, of the legal ramifications. They're going to be huge. However, I think law will be able to deal with them. Um, uh, law has, has ways of dealing with huge changes, it's always been very good about it, so I'm pretty sure we'll be good here and you'll see in a minute why. So the third point is, we already know, we foresee, we clearly know and can foresee that there will be huge changes. And they will not be legal per se, they will be matters of public policy. So the third part, um, which I will have to stop short because you're gonna call me on time, uh, is drawing on a book that Professor Aviv Gaon and I are writing, uh, you know, we'll be very happy to have pre-orders and sign copies for a mere 25% extra, um, is going to be on the public policy implications. And the reason I'm touting them now is because I really don't want to hear in 20 years, oh, we wish we could have thought about it. We can think about it, and most of these things are very clear, going, clearly going to happen now. So now I'm going to go over my 21 slides faster because I've told you all of my points. Okay. So how am I moving the slides? Try, Try what? Error. Errors? Error. Okay. So clearly, you know, we've all seen these pictures. We've all been very excited about AVs. Um, but you know, as lawyers, the only, person, only ones who can see are courts, you know, in retrospect, when you file the suit and they have to decide whether it was something that was foreseeable. And one of the most beautiful quotes I have from a California co court says, on a clear day, you can foresee forever. But that's if you're a judge 20 years uh, behind. Now, you know, in the, it's a little bit more difficult in advance. Um, AVs, are we there yet, asked the donkey. Well, uh, no. So four years ago, I gave my first talk on AVs. We were very, very excited. It was going to come really, really soon. It's four years later, and I'm re-inviting myself for four years from now to say, nah, we're not there yet. Um, basically, there are two reasons why we're not there yet. One is technological, and the engineers will explain to you that this is not going to be simple, and we actually have our one suggestion for that. And the second part is human. Um, you know, but you promised. Um, so one of the answers, the, the second pro problem, sorry, is, is transition time. And one of the things, the, the only th slide I, I bring here from 2018 is this one. So there were cars in the US starting in 1900, and there were millions of cars pretty soon. But only basically in the 30s did the number of cars exceed the number of horses, which is pretty shocking when you think about it. So I'm not suggesting we bring horses back, although that could be cute. 
uh, but you know, a lot of cleaning there. It's going to be really difficult to clean the horses. But what I'm saying is autonomous vehicles will come in, but like electric vehicles, this will take a lot of time. There will be a fraction of the cars, then there will be more of the cars, and eventually there will be you know, all of the cars, but that will take decades. So you know, what about transitions? Uh, the second problem is public acceptance, and I really don't want to spend too much time on this, but it's a really nice slide. So they asked Americans, because Americans actually answer the phone when you call them, and they asked them, you know, are you likely to embrace autonomous vehicles? You know, going into a pod you have no control over that, you know, might and very likely will kill you. And the, the very interesting data is that Americans are warming up to it. I don't have Canadian data or Israeli, so that's, that's all the data I have. At the moment, uh, what I find of a, a pretty amazing 55% of U.S. adults are actually willing to contemplate that. The, the data for uh, you know, pilotless planes is a lot, a lot lower than that. But it's interesting to know that women are more cautious. It's 35%, uh, 65% of men, but only 45% or so of women, which makes a lot more sense. And when you look at the ages, the younger you are, the more likely you are to be willing to embrace. So you know, under 30, you know, 70% are willing to embrace over 65, 40-something percent. And also when you look at education, the higher your education, the less, uh, the less guarded you are. Uh, so people who have high school education or less, 50% of them are unlikely to be willing. But if you have postgraduate education, two-thirds are willing to trust the machine, which and I'm going to say this only in one note. It's going to be more in the book, and if not in this book, in the next one. This is again part of the ongoing political divide between people who trust science, the machine, uh, academia, uh, what people are telling them, and people who trust people they've seen on Oprah give medical advice. You know, no pun intended. Um, so what if it ha actually happens? And we are guessing, and we have a few guesstimates. So let me start with our premise. We actually think that the best thing to do with autonomous vehicles um, is not to have all this discussion of how, how to share uh, the road with regular cars and with pedestrians, because that's going to be very difficult. But it's probably going to be worthy of giving them their own lanes or even their own roads, especially at very, very condensed um, areas. So this is one of our assumptions, that autonomous vehicles, at least at some point, will get at least in the beginning, will get their own roads. Our second assumption is that the autonomous vehicle revolution will sort of swallow the, uh, the electric car revolution, and that by the time we have uh, uh, autonomous vehicles, they will mostly be um, uh, electric. And the reason is that one of the benefits is, or one of the big ben potential benefits, is to uh, air, air quality and to inner city lives of people who are actually uh, um, suffocating from um, uh, cars. Um, our, our third assumption or question is we have no idea whether the autonomous vehicles will be privately owned, will be taxis, will be buses, uh, but our assumption is that once you get into the city with the autonomous vehicle, whatever it is, you don't need to park it, you don't need to take care of it, you don't need to handle it, and that's going to be uh, of great importance um, in the next 15 minutes or so. Okay. So. What we are going to say is we are absolutely sure that autonomous vehicles are coming mostly because the stakes are so huge. You know, humans, now that we have autonomous vehicles, we realize humans shouldn't drive. It actually makes no sense. I don't enjoy driving, but humans shouldn't drive because they're such imperfect drivers. Uh, the uh, uh, um, American agency estimates that 94% of all collisions are due to human error. 94%. Now, remember, even if autonomous vehicles are not going to be perfect, which we demand of them, they're very likely going to have a much, much lower collision rate than 94%, right? If only 5% are due to uh, 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 AV error, that's, that's, uh, that's good enough. That's even better than the current uh, condition. Now, we, are, we realize that some people like to drive. Some people also like to ride horses and, you know, take them out. We can you know, allocate them the spaces to take out their cars, ride to their heart's content, probably not with horses at the same time, but otherwise, you know, I really don't see why we have to keep cars just because people enjoy driving cars. Reduction of estimates, reduction of commute times, uh, more productive commutes, assuming you can actually read, write, sleep, eat, whatever you want to do. And one of the many issues we, we talk about in the book, and I will just mention it really briefly, 
is the issue of, pa of, of uh, parking spaces. If our assumption is correct, and most experts talk about this, and the whole premise of autonomous vehicle is that you don't need to park it. It takes you to work and then you don't need to, to park it. Just think what's going to happen once we get rid of, uh, we're going to need less roads, but we're also not going to need parking spaces. So um, in a city like Los Angeles, where an estimated 50% of the entire territory is parking spaces and roads, just think of you know 2% gain, 3% gain, 5% gain, freed up spaces. What a mayor like you could do with this is absolutely uh, breathtaking. My uh, electric vehicle assumption also assumes less pollution. All of this is very, very enticing. OK. I'm going to jump over the next stage, and I'm just going to say this. Uh, I'm not going to go over the law of the horse, but I'm going to say this. Um, and I'm also going to jump over this. I'm absolutely sure that the law, which has seen many, many changes, will be able to absorb uh, current changes. Just to give you a quick, quick, uh, a quick note about this, people are very worried who is going to pay for accidents and what's going to happen. Well, you know, we've had experience with railroads and then with horses and then with cars. You know, tort and insurance law is going to be able to find solutions. I'm hardly worried about that. We will find solutions. They're going to be complicated, maybe it's going to be state-run, whatever, but this is not something that's going to require a new set of, of a new framework for the law. Uh, most of the classic issues have been with us for actually thousands of years. We'll find an answer. Okay. Two, three little points and I'm finished. I promise I'm finished. I've just no looked at the time. Traffic law. So one of the interesting things we note is that there will be a lot less use for traffic law. We won't need traffic law. There will be a lot less traffic stops. We do realize this is not completely realistic, that most of what we're saying is, is about urban cities, about cities in less urban cities, in less urban areas, in open areas, uh, uh, rural areas. This is going to be completely different. There's going to be uh, ridership, there's going to be policing and so on. But once you go on your AV, why do you need police? This is going to be huge because people don't like traffic law, because people don't like to be stopped. Most of the encounters of individuals with the police are during traffic stops. This is not good for police, which is not particularly uh, liked by, by individuals. Uh, a lot of uh, uh, civil rights issues, uh, you know, uh, uh, who are they stopping, why are they stopping uh, on all of this issue. This will go away, or potentially will go away, once you get on your taxi now called autonomous vehicle. However, and this is where our book sort of covers stuff, and I'm going to go over this quickly, and you're going to ask me to not to do so. We actually suggest that not having traffic law might not be such a great thing. I know this is somewhat, somewhat counterintuitive. This is why the book is worth buying. And we're talking about the hardcover. For one thing, we actually think the traffic law is a form of legal education. In a really weird way, traffic law is maybe the most wide form, wide form of education we give everyone. We give our children, and we give it repeatedly. If this is maybe the only area, only area of the law that we teach children, right? Before we teach them about the Constitution and civil rights, we teach them, you know, when you go on the road, look right, look left. And we, and we also tell them how to control it themselves and whom to trust, who not to trust. So in a bizarre sort of way, this is going to go away. And, you know, like we're talking about whether we should keep teaching children cursive, shouldn't we keep teach them about traffic law? Now, traffic law is not just about being careful about traffic. This is also about letting other people cross, understanding who crosses first, understanding how to behave. This is about human conduct, about human behavior. And so this is a much bigger issue, and giving this up is not such a, a joke. This is also one of the last shared spaces. Um, you have to be basically the president not to share the road. You can be very rich or very poor, and we are in a society that draws people apart. We, don't, we live in ever, uh, um, the number of people living in every single unit uh, goes down every year. So we're actually living more separately, work more separately, and bizarrely enough, the roads are one of the last places we have to interact. We have to respect each other, we have to see what other people are doing, we have to interact, social skills. All of this might be gone, and this is not something that we should ignore. Maybe we should be willing to give it up, but we shouldn't ignore this uh, altogether. Um, one more thing, and this is sort of uh, maybe my, well, this is 20, so this is the end. Um, even if we give up classic traffic law, we're going to have a new traffic law. So we're going to have a police that will have to interact directly with our car. 
So the, when the policeman sees our car doing something wrong, suppose we throw something out of the window and they want to stop us. Will the police be able to interact with the car directly, just tell it to stop? Uh, uh, what's going to happen with the data this car has? So we're actually opening a brand new can of worms. And all of this is very clear now. And this is only a sort of a small part, a sampling of the issues that we raise. I think the technological issues are sort of clouding uh, uh, the new constructs that we clearly see are going to happen, going to take place, I'm going to have to, to think about it. And um, all of this, we think, uh, is sort of clear to us um, uh, now. Um, so basically what we're saying is we don't think law is going to be a problem. We think law is going to be, as usual, the solution. And we need public policy discussion among you know, public policy deciders, mayors, uh, uh, and other basically political actors to decide what we want. And we think that in all revolutions, there are going to be winners and losers. Uh, we, we understand that in all revolutions, there are winners and, use, and losers. And just to give you one little example, what's going to happen with this freed up resource of parking spaces, right? Who's actually going to compensate the poor people who now own parking lots that are going to be irrelevant? Uh, what are we going to do with, with these territories? What are we going to do uh, uh, with these funds? All of this has to be debated or considered now because we can't be surprised and shocked to find out in 20, 30 years, assuming global warming doesn't kill us. Before that, we couldn't really be shocked to find all these things. There's lots of policy implications, and I sort of assumed that I'll always stay my welcome. So this is a good time to say, I'm done. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Since we have just, I think, four minutes left, what I think we'll do is this. Uh, the panel has obviously given uh, us a lot to think about um, from, uh, from various perspectives. But I do think it's, it's really important in life to, to kind of crystallize what, what, what are the essentials. So I'm going to give all of you a one minute opportunity to essentially uh, speak directly to the people in this room and people that are watching us uh, on online um, to really say if you could leave us just with one message, one key message uh, from your presentation that requires all of our attention, what would it be? Me, me first? Okay, good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, I'd say just very, very quickly, the one thing uh, that kind of stood, stood to me is the comment about winners and losers. Um, I would say that uh, from a government perspective, our job is, is to look out for everyone, of course. So let's, let's really figure out who is winning, who is, who is, who is losing, and minimize the, the amount of losers and figure out a way that we can sort of um, uh, lead us all into a, a better, more digital future. So, yeah. Thank you. Perfect segue. <laughs> Everyone needs to get involved in the decision about how we control our data, who controls it, look at data trusts and other standards that are being developed around AI and data right now. Um, because data governance has come up, uh, pretty much all of us mentioned it. It's one of the most important things to think about, but not only about how that's being done, but how do we as individuals uh, adequately understand what we are agreeing to when we share our data and how can we uh, select the context and the ways our data can be used. We need to simplify that process, not just for people who have cognitive differences, but for all of us. I know I signed away a lot when I agreed to the Honk app today, uh, but I didn't read it. It was too long. Uh, and so we, we can't have those kinds of ways that we give permission. We need to create a new process and everyone can get involved in that. Thank you for that. Yeah, I think, I think as I made the point, AI is neither good nor bad. It's what we make it, and it's what we program it and biases we put into it. But I think as leaders, as future generations here, it's, it's data. It's all ones and zeros. So what is our expectation of privacy with those ones and zeros that may not be traditional? It may not be just credit card numbers and addresses. It could be images. It could be your backyard. It could be whatever. But I think that's, I think training for the users of the, the engineers of the top of mind is that 
what we're bringing to market and what we're utilizing to make our communities better meets those standards, but also at the same time, it's, it's protected. And it can't just be, we do a lot of protection for your credit card information. That same type of protection needs to be across all of your data, your images, your backyards, and your right to privacy. I think that's something that we as a society really need to work on and establish boundaries and guidelines around. Because I think there's a lot of good there, but then also with that data being out there, we also need to protect that data a lot better, especially as it gets to third parties. Thanks, Heath. Professor? I think I've said all I had to say. I'll, I'll yield my, the time back to the break. If that's okay. I think I'm just going to yield the time back to the break and <laughs> say thank you to all for being patient with my slum, somewhat long talk. So. Yeah. Thank you so much. And the professor actually wants to end this very quickly because he wants you to go and pre-order his book. Um, <laughs> professor, thank you. I really enjoyed your, your comments. Uh, to everyone, we just, uh, Pina, yeah. we're the, we were the first. Yeah. We were the first. We broke the ice yeah. and on time. Yeah. So thanks, everybody, for your participation. You gave us a lot to think about. Yeah.